Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, my name is John DeLynn. Um, the date today is Wednesday, June 8, 2016. Uh, I look a little bit different. If you're watching through YouTube, I look a little bit different because I've got my hat on and my headset. We're recording this live in my basement uh, in North Logan. And um, we're super excited today to have with us someone who I've wanted to interview for at least 14 years. I guess that's not totally true because I didn't have a podcast 14 years ago. Didn't know I'd be interviewing people. But I can say that uh, Thomas Murphy, Dr. Thomas Murphy, was someone who was a really important part of my early journey um, sort of to begin questioning and processing LDS truth claims. So uh, let me just give you a bit of an introduction to get you really excited about this interview. I'm guessing it's going to be two, uh, two hours, three hours. We've got a lot to cover. Um, Dr. Murphy uh, is a, he has a PhD in anthropology from the University of Washington, and he is a professor. He's the chair of the Department of Anthropology at Edmonds Community College in Linwood, Washington where we're going to talk about all this in depth, but where I learned about Thomas Murphy was uh, along with Simon Southerton in, in the early 2000s. Um, I believe that, that Mike uh, uh, Th Thomas was, was probably what, you know, along with Simon, the first to publish about DNA um, and the Book of Mormon and to, to begin questioning the possibility that that what we consider to be Native Americans are are in fact descendants of, you know, uh, Hebrews or Israelites that traveled to America in 1600 BC. So he published what I think was the first peer-reviewed journal article about DNA in the Book of Mormon, and it landed him on the hot seat, such that he was actually um, called to a disciplinary court, I believe, in 2002. Um, but what was strange about that was that because uh, the press was notified, and I believe they even showed up at the parking lot of the church headquarters uh, of, of the of the stake center. Uh, the disciplinary council was called off, and to this day, I don't believe he has faced church discipline, um, uh, even though he no longer believes and has held to his claim that the Book of Mormon isn't historical and all that stuff. But what I've learned is that there's a lot more to his story, and even back then, there was a lot more that he was trying to do than than validate or invalidate LDS church truth claims. His specialty is in, let's just say, I'll say Native American anthropology, um, and he's going to have a chance to correct everything that I say or miss say in this introduction. But he he has a real focus on what he calls decolonization, and basically we're going to get into what that means. But it's all about how. Um, you know, Western Europeans came to the United States and colonized the Native Americans in ways that were horrific and abusive and uh, um, and how that legacy of colonization lives to this day and how if we're ever going to find healing and peace and a constructive way to move forward, not just in America, but in um, the LDS Church and even in Mormon studies, we need to go through the process of decolonization ourselves. Um, he has a lot to say uh, about all of these topics, about racism within the church. Uh, he's done a lot of great work on racism um, and, um, and ways that we can move forward in a more healthy manner. And so um, I'm just very delighted to have uh, Dr. Thomas Murphy here with us today on Mormon Stories. I'm super excited. So I'm going to actually turn the camera around now, and I'm going to point it back at, at Thomas. Murphy, Dr. Thomas Murphy. How are you doing, brother? I'm doing very well, thank you. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to have you with us um, today on Mormon Stories. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us. It's an honor. Uh, you know, it's kind of neat to be back in Logan. I was here 30 years ago as a student at Utah State. Oh, wow. So you're an Aggie. I went for two quarters, and then I dropped out of college. But, you know, and then I, I went back later. And where would you do your undergrad? I, a, after Utah State, I eventually returned to school at the University of Iowa. Okay, so Iowa yeah. was your undergrad, Washington was grad school. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we have a. I, I'm going to try and not, I'm going to try and make what very well could be a six-hour John DeLynn Mormon Stories interview into like, let's just say a two to two and a half hour interview. So, 
I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a little bit more uh, concise. Is that all right? That's all right with me. Okay. So tell us just a bit about your, your Mormon upbringing prior to uh, kind of grad school. Okay. Well, I was actually born in Los Angeles, California, uh, and my family was from Idaho, uh, from southern Idaho. And uh, my father had moved, uh, taken a job in uh, uh, southern California to work for this new company uh, called IBM. <laughs> uh, and uh, his goal was to make enough money to return to Idaho and per buy a farm. Uh, and he achieved that uh, within a couple of years of my birth. Uh, and we returned to Idaho, which is where my memories start. Uh, so I grew up in southern Idaho. Uh, the early years spent on a farm. Uh, and uh, that was near uh, Burley and Paul area. Uh, and I. Uh, I don't have a lot of early memories of church, and I think we were, sometimes we were maybe a little bit semi-active at the time. Uh, I remember more water skiing on Sundays and stuff like that. But uh, after my parents got divorced, uh, and I was seven years old, uh, my, we we moved first into to Paul and Rupert, and eventually ended up in Burley, uh, and that's where my memories of the church really start. Uh, and uh, my mother dived in quite, quite strongly. Uh, and eventually my stepfather uh, was particularly, he was a convert and particularly devout. Uh, and and it, from a John Birch Society sort of framework, Cleone, Skousen, uh, that sort of uh, approach to Mormonism. Uh, and he's the one who baptized me when I was eight in Burley. Uh, and my, you know, in the, at early on, I was, when, while we lived in Burley, I was actually probably a little bit more of a rebellious kid. Uh, and I remember uh, running around Burley and doing things like stealing our dog out of the dog pound and, you know, things that later in, in life when I got really devout, I, wouldn't, I would never have done. Uh, but I think the, the kids I was running around with and uh, I just hadn't. You know, I hadn't processed and thought a lot about church issues at the time. But we moved to Pocatello when I was around 10. Uh, and that's where I became really uber Mormon. Uh, and, you know, by the time I, I was entering priesthood, I was deacon's corn president, teacher's corn president, even priest uh, first assistant. Uh, I think that's what they called it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, but about the time I was in the... It, the, the the priests, you know, kind of my really it was really my sophomore and junior year of uh, high school. I joined the, the high school debate team, uh, and in the in debate you had to argue both sides of an issue, uh, for and against things. And this black and white world that I'd grown up in all of a sudden got really gray, uh, and that's when I started questioning things. Uh, when I was about 16, 17. Uh, and uh, we moved to uh, to St. Anthony, Idaho, uh, very close to my 17th birthday. And so right before uh, I started my senior year of high school. Uh, and at that time, I, I was very, well, I didn't want, as a, as, as a rebellious teenager, I didn't want to, uh, be that involved with the church. Actually, I should say there was a really turning point for me in, that I should mention that happened in Pocatello. Uh, my seminary teacher uh, assaulted a student in class. Uh, like beat him up? Uh, kicked him. Whoa. And uh, that really felt to me like that was inappropriate behavior uh -huh. uh, from a seminary teacher. Yeah. Uh, and, <laughs> so. uh, and, you know, I... I came home and, and talked to my, my mom about it, and she was actually good friends with the seminary teacher who was in our ward, uh, and defended him. And I said, well, I'm not going to go to seminary anymore until he's gone. Uh, and uh, so I stopped going to seminary. Uh, and, and I stopped going to church, too. Uh, and uh, when, I, when we moved to St. Anthony, uh, under pressure from my mother, I agreed that I would start going back to church, but I wouldn't do seminary. Uh, and so 
uh, in St. Anthony, I did attend church at least for about the first half of my senior year. Uh, but pretty soon I just, I was working on Sundays by that time and uh, working at McDonald's in Rexburg. Uh, and, and so that became my excuse and uh, for, for not, uh, not going to church. But in Rexburg, I, I met this uh, Ricks College student that was what's now BYU-Idaho, uh, and her name was Carrie Sumner, and uh, we got uh, started dating, uh, and actually ended up in a situation with the church that 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 pushed us even further away, uh, and that it was a. We both were working at McDonald's in Rexburg, uh, and anybody that's that's lived in that area knows that every now and then you get these big snowstorms. Uh, and we had this very large snowstorm, uh, and there were, you know, several feet of snowdrifts on the roads for me to get home. I lived in the Egan area by St. Anthony, and it was a few a few miles away from Rexburg to get home, and all the roads were closed. Uh, and we got off work around midnight, and I my brother and I and uh, Carrie and we I often took Carrie home uh, to to her apartment uh, and so the roads were clear enough in town we could get her home but my brother Greg and I had nowhere to go uh, and she's like well you could stay at our apartment which was of course uh, Ricks College approved housing uh, and so we uh, spent the night in that apartment you know that at that point in our relationship, uh, we didn't, you know, we weren't uh, sexually involved or anything like that, uh, and yet I did spend the night in her apartment, and uh, that would lead to uh, accusations by her roommates that led to an honors, honor code uh, investigation. And that's, of course, in the news today, so yeah. <laughs> these honor code things. And there's, there's a good example of where honor code uh, enforcement becomes a real problem. Uh, and so Carrie was called in uh, by her bishop and interviewed about these accusations that her roommates had placed. And the, the only true accusation was that I had spent the night in the apartment, and so had my brother Greg. Uh, the rest of the accusations got pretty wild about all this... Uh, drinking and drugs and sex and, you know, just stuff that just wasn't true uh, that her roommates had imagined that we were doing. Uh, and because the bishop had heard these stories from the roommates, uh, he told Carrie that, uh, that the spirit had told him that they were true mm. and that he had this spiritual confirmation that she was lying, uh, but she was telling the truth. And uh, for her and for me, because it impacted me as well, uh, that really added to the doubts that we already, at least I already was having about the church. And uh, for her, I think it was a it was a big impetus for for more doubt about the church. And because uh, you know she was an, an an active attending Mormon at the time, and I was you know a little bit rebellious. But for her, that was a key turning point because she knew the bishop didn't have an inspiration. You know whatever he thought was inspiration. Uh, wasn't God speaking, or at least God didn't know what was going on. Uh, and so uh, the, she would end up in initially being suspended. Uh, and uh, her dad, who worked for the church, uh, the, the CES, Church Education System, uh, was very upset about the mistreatment uh, that she had had at, at Rick's and uh, actually came to Rick's and uh, confronted uh, the people involved and got her suspension. Uh, suspended, or I mean her suspension withheld, I think is the technical term they used. Uh, but she'd already missed three weeks of class by that point and uh, ended up being a, a scar on her academic career and would make it difficult for her to later get back in college. But, uh, you know, we were just dating at the time, but I think that going through that experience really brought us together as a couple because we uh, felt the injustice of it and, you know, uh, if, so, if somebody were, were to try and dismiss that as, oh my gosh, well, you were just offended and that's why you left, how, how would you respond? Was it more than just being offended uh, for you? It, it, it was more that, yeah, in the sense that sure, certainly we were offended, 
But that wasn't the primary issue. The primary issue was that question of credibility. Uh, if the bishop, the person that we thought the way we had been raised was that uh, he had some sort of direct line to God, uh, this uh, line of inspiration, that it was clear that that was not what it was claimed to be. Uh, so it was, it was a truth claim uh, that, that, that we wrestled with. But even then, we, we didn't completely walk away from the church at that time. Uh, that would, wouldn't come for several years later. But what we did do at that time was, I didn't want to serve a mission, and so uh, our rebellious act is we got married. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you didn't serve a mission. Yeah. So I got married right. At, I was right out of high school, uh, and I had had a scholarship to come to Utah State, uh, and so we got married right right before I moved to to Logan, and uh, began my freshman year of college. Uh, and so that was a way to. I think it, 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 you don't think of marriage normally as a rebellious act, uh, but for us it was. Uh, and you know it was a way to say, well, you can't tell me I, that I need to go on a mission now. Uh, and you know at, at Utah State, I didn't enroll in, in the institute or anything like that, uh, but we did occasionally attend our in, in our ward. But we weren't didn't feel particularly welcome. Uh, but we'd go on occasion. Uh, and you know again we had doubts, but we were we were still very Mormon and saw ourselves as Mormon. And uh, uh, you know we. I uh, spent uh, almost a year here uh, before uh, Carrie, in that first year of our marriage, uh, Carrie got pregnant and uh, we decided that we would uh, move uh, to Iowa where she was from. Uh, because I, before, before uh, she got pregnant, I had signed up for the, the Army Reserve and I'd been scheduled for basic training and uh, AIT or the Advanced Individual Training during the, the summer between what would have been my freshman and sophomore year. Uh, but that would have left Carrie home alone to, to take care of uh, you know, a, a brand new baby. And so we decided we would move back to Iowa where she could stay at her parents' home and have some support. Actually, initially, we tried to get out of, I tried to get out of the basic training. Uh, and I just couldn't. I'd already signed the contract, and the Army was not negotiable. Uh, and so we ended up in. Uh, Davenport, Iowa, where she was from, uh, and she moved back, uh, staying with her parents, and I was there temporarily, and then uh, I went to training, uh, and then uh, after my training, we lived with her parents for a little while. So what did you study in your undergrad at Iowa? Well, I didn't go back to school immediately. We started businesses, uh, and we uh, we got involved in uh, marketing. Uh, Carrie was a great artist, and uh, we did some marketing and graphic design some merchandising work, uh, and uh, worked in the restaurant business and did some consulting. Uh, but that our business career didn't go a long ways, and uh, we ended up getting involved with a with, with a con artist, basically, is the best way to describe it. Uh, and unknowingly assisted him in uh, conning a lot of people. Uh, and what was the con? It was Just over briefly. businesses, uh, buying and selling of real estate and businesses, uh, buying a lot of things on credit and then selling them uh, without paying off the credit. Hmm. Uh, and, and, and then going bankrupt? Yeah, and going but, bankrupt. But pocketing the, yeah. the yeah. difference. Yeah, and, you know, and he, he used me for a lot of the handling of the cash, uh, which, you know, I was a naive young person who you know, still believed the world was a great and uh, friendly place. <laughs> uh, but having... How, how did it feel to be used as part of a con? Uh, rather disconcerting, yeah. I mean, that really... Uh, and I think that would later contribute to my doubts about the church is because uh, I saw myself very easily taken in uh, and with you know a little bit of patting on the back and encouragement, uh, I you know fell right into what should have been in retrospect an obvious uh, facade. And you know I can look back and see. I even remember other people in the that were working for us 
uh, figuring it out before I did and uh, telling me and, and I wouldn't believe them and uh, I ended up in their positions. I became vice president of, of these companies and you know, that was kind of cool. I was like, what, 18, 19, 19 years old and I was vice president of, of several companies, you know. Uh, and so, you know, it felt really cool uh, until uh, he ends up, he disappears and I'm left to, to file bankruptcy. Uh, for the companies, uh, and that's when it really dawned on me. Actually, what, what when there were investigators that were hired by, I think it was Bank One, and they started investigating me because I'd handled all the cash. Uh, and uh, we were, I, we were at, at that time, we were active in the church, and I actually had gone to an attorney that was in, in our stake, uh, and you know, I said, look, I, I'm being investigated, and. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on, you know. But I talked it all through him, and, and he's the one who explained to me that, I, you know, nearly everything that he did was legal. The only thing he could say that was illegal uh, was using a fake name. And we're fairly certain he was using a fake name. But other than that, it was, it was all legal. And so all this stuff that I had done that I was starting to worry about uh, was all just business. Uh, and that kind of would raise questions for me too, in terms of really, could is it okay just to rob people and call that business? Could something be legal but still unethical? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so that was a relief, though, that I didn't have anything to worry about as far as uh, potential prosecution and stuff. But uh, that would have a big impact on on the way I thought about the world. Uh, and so. After that business failed, uh, and we were trying to figure out, all right, what do we do now? Uh, that's when I decided I was going to go back to college. And so I applied for admission to the University of Iowa and the Univers University of Illinois and decided on Iowa uh, and the Hawkeyes. Yeah, Hawkeyes. Yeah. And so uh, at the University of Iowa, I was initially, what was I initially, a, I think a botany and political science major. Uh, and it, at Utah State, I'd been in economics and political science. I wanted to be a lawyer at that point. Uh, and I would started to get this science interest, I, th I think, at that time. And that's why I kind of combined those two. Uh, that didn't last particularly long. Uh, I would eventually, after jumping around with a few different majors, I was pre-med for a while. Uh, I was pre-med and pre-law, actually. Uh, and those aren't exactly majors. You, have, you still have to choose a major in addition. Uh, and I had uh, chosen, well, I should say, while I was pre-med and pre-law, my, my National Guard unit got activated uh, for the Persian Gulf War. Uh, so this was in 1990. 90. Yeah, 1990. Uh, and so in the middle of my uh, semester, uh, I, I get activated and I've got to withdraw from my classes. Uh, and so I go, well, not necessarily withdraw, but at least go talk to my professors because uh, we were more than two-thirds of the way through the quarter. And so I went and talked to all my professors and they were very generous in uh, just giving me the, most of them just gave me the grade at the point that I was at and a few had me do a, a, a couple of additional assignments but uh, that I could quickly get done. Uh, and my anthropology professor, uh, his name was Mac Marshall, uh, is the only professor who asked me what I thought about being deployed for the war. Uh, and I, I remember telling him that I don't really want to give my life for the price of oil, and that's what I felt like I was being asked to do. Uh, and he gave me some sage advice. He said, he said, you know, anthropologists often find themselves in situations where they don't necessarily agree with what's happening around them. Uh, but you can be a participant observer using a little bit of cultural relativism, and you can, you have an incredible opportunity to study human behavior uh, in war. Uh, and so, following his advice, uh, I approached it as a research project. Uh, and so, the study and a soldier's perspective on the Persian Gulf War became my honors thesis in anthropology at the University of Iowa. And by so by the time that I was uh, returning to school, 
uh, I had completely changed my mindset about where I wanted to go with my career. Uh, I was pre-med and pre-law at that time because I was going to get rich as a lawyer, and if not as a lawyer, I was going to get rich as a doctor. Uh, and, uh, and I knew I was capable of both. Uh, but I started asking myself, well, the greed that I was seeing in the war, do I want that to be my signature in life? And when I, when I had to put my life on the line, what am I willing to die for? Uh, and not for what I was being asked, although I did, I did go. And, uh, uh, but that's not what I, what I, if I could choose what I would die for, that was not the choice I would make. Uh, and so I came back committed to trying to understand people and trying to build relationships between people and to un undo the biases of class and race and gender uh, and the major issues of the day uh, and to use anthropology as a means to do that. Uh, and so I became an anthropology major. Uh, and I, along the way, I started taking a few religion classes. Uh, and I remember feeling when, when we moved to Iowa City from Davenport, Carrie and I had decided to stop going to church. We'd been, I should say that we had, when we were in Davenport at the time we were running those businesses, we, we had gone through the temple and we'd gotten very active. And, uh, but the temple had been a, a rather shocking experience for me. Uh, and so, and for Carrie. Uh, and so the t that would play a role in, in us wanting to stop going to church when we moved to, to, to Iowa City, uh, away from where her parents were in her parents' ward. Uh, but I guess I should talk about what happened in the temple. It was uh, our daughter, Jessica, was still nursing at the time. Uh, and so we had we'd been, uh, we, we did the endowment ceremony and then we were going to do our sealing. Uh, and so Jessica had been in the nursing, nursery while we were uh, in the endowment ceremony. And as we go... Is this uh, for yourselves or for... For ourselves. The yeah. dead. For ourselves. So you weren't initially married in the temple? No. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. And so this was a decision later to get married in the temple. Yeah. And so we... In, uh, when we came into the ceiling room, uh, they brought Jessica from the nursery. Uh, and she was still nursing. And so the first thing she wanted to do when she saw her mother was, was eat. Uh, and they had no provision for that. Uh, and uh, so she started crying, which is a normal reaction for a baby. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they asked Carrie to calm her down. Uh, and, and Carrie took her out in the hall and tried to calm her down. In, in retrospect, you know, she wishes she had nursed her at that time, but she didn't. She was trying to just calm her down a little bit and bring her back in. So she get her, gets her calmed down, brings her back into the room, and as immediately when she comes into the room and sees, again, all these people in white, and it's really bizarre and, and familiar, uh, and she starts crying again. And, and the officiator told me that I needed to, to hold her down on the altar. And uh, I, it, I get it. My stepfather had been very abusive as, as a, when I was a kid. And when, when Carrie and I had had a, a child, we, we, had, we had both experienced a, abuse at home. And we had decided we were never going to physically punish our child, that we were never going to use physical punishment. And that was a commitment we'd made to each other. And so here we are in the temple, and I wasn't, asked, I wasn't being asked to strike my child, but I was being asked to hold her down against her will. And I did it. Uh, and after the ceremony, the officiator said to me, he said, you know, we don't normally expect people to do things like that in the church, but this is so important. And uh, 
I I felt like I had violated her in, in that act of holding her down and that I'd violated myself in my, in my commitment to me. I'd violated my commitment to my wife that we wouldn't do that. Uh, and uh, that really broke the straw of my belief. I just, uh, I should add that there were the, the other things that, there have been things that I'd read when I was in high school uh, uh, from the Godmaker's book about, you know, some of the temple ceremonies, and I thought they were all made up. Uh, and the Godmaker yeah, accusations, were yeah, made were up. all made up. Yeah. yeah, and I also going through the endowment discovered that those blood oath covenants and stuff were not exactly fake. This was before they were taken out of the temple ceremony. Uh, so that that add to that on the intellectual level, that deeply emotional experience of doing something that. I believed was wrong, and being asked to do that by the church, and not only being asked but doing it, uh, and I couldn't—I just could not. Uh, if I was going to be in a situation where I would be abusing other people because I was being asked to, and and I would do that, I couldn't live with that. And I, I had to, it felt like to me that the best way to deal with that situation was to walk away from the church. Uh, because then I wouldn't be asked to do the, the things that I thought were wrong. Uh, and uh, so when we moved to Iowa well, was, City. I, I just, this is just the storyteller and me wanting to connect dots a little yeah. bit. Was there any connection in your mind between having helped a, uh, a fraudster defraud people and being mm -hmm. complicit in the fraud mm -hmm. do you think there was either subconscious or consciously any connection between that and then uh, being a participant in sort of what you felt was a little bit abusive of your child did did you even draw that connection or yes I did and particularly w during the war because during the war I had a lot of time to think about that stuff and, uh, Did the temple stuff happen before the war? Before the war. Okay, got yeah. it, got it. Yeah, and, and during the war I had a lot of time to think about that, and I I'd had a lot of time to read. Uh, and uh, and actually, it was the, the book I was reading was the one I saw on your bookshelf, Kayam Potuk. Which one? Uh, Kayam Potuk's uh, The Chosen, Asher The Lev. Promise, it was the My Asher, Name is Asher Lev. My Name is Asher Lev. Okay. And I, I read that during the war, and uh, it, that had a really profound impact on me. Uh, and and so I, I I had a lot of conversations with uh, with friends uh, and I, for a while we were uh, positioned near a lot of a unit from Utah and so I had a, a lot of conversations with with Mormons uh, and so I was processing a lot of this stuff uh, during the war uh, and you know that's where I really you know when when you're when you're asked to place everything on the line, that's when you really start to look inwardly and say, what is it that I really believe? Uh, and a lot of that I processed in letters back and forth with Carrie. Uh, and uh, I didn't believe in this whole image of a, of a Mormon god, this anthropomorphic uh, person, uh, and I, I should say that another book that I'd read that was quite profound was Elie Wiesel's Night. Uh, Wait, what did you what did you take from My Name Is Usher Lev, and then tell us what you took from Night? From My Name Is Asher Lev was uh, the the challenge that the protagonist and now it, it, it's been so many well Asher Love was his name I guess <laughs> yeah. but yeah, I, I don't remember all the other characters. He was an artist. But, yeah um, yeah I remember that yeah. And Jewish he, Orthodox Hasidic yeah, so Jew. I, I, re I resonated with the, the Orthodox Jewish experience as being similar to my Mormon upbringing uh, and the kind of gradual in his case of, of, of uh, starting to question the cultural norms that were associated with that, and then having the courage to defy those norms, 
uh, that I admired that and I, I resonated with that and uh, and and so that struck me very deeply uh, and then with Elie Wiesel's Night and these had both been books that had been assigned in a class I was in uh, in the, the religion department before before the war uh, and I hadn't finished all of them before I, I got deployed uh, but I did continue to read them and uh, and with Night that it's Elie Wiesel's account of being in the concentration camps. In the Holocaust. Yeah, in, in, World, in War II. World War II. And, uh, and being abandoned by God. And I felt the same thing. I felt abandoned by God. I felt that God wasn't there when I needed him. Uh, and When did you need him in the story you've told us so far? I needed him in the temple, that's for sure. Uh, and... Uh, it, what what I saw was an abusive father. I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see Jesus Christ. Uh, it, it, that's not what I experienced uh, in the temple. Yeah, is that what you I, mean? Yeah, I I experienced an abusive father. That's what I experienced. Meaning the and, officiator and, who told yeah. you to be abusive. Yeah, and you and were, to me that's not what Jesus represents. Uh, at least not what I read in the New Testament. That's not what I read in Third Nephi. Uh, and uh, but at the time, would it have occurred to you that people make mistakes and nobody's perfect, and you know that, or was yeah, there something? Yeah, but yes, it did. But the thing is, is at the places where the Spirit is supposed to be most present, in a bishop's interview, in the temple, that's where the breakdown was happening. Those were the places that were supposed to be the exception. They were the places that, that were supposed things. to be yeah. most likely that God would be there. Right, yeah. And governing. Right, yeah. And and he wasn't. Or at least what what was there wasn't what uh, you thought was I, godly. Yeah, I thought God ought to be. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and even, you know, what I, yeah, it was wasn't what I expected the church to be and what I believed it ought to be. Uh, and so I, I was let down. Uh, but during the war, I made the decision that uh, I was no longer going to be pre-law, pre-med, and I decided I was going to major in anthropology, and I was going to work towards peace. Uh, and when I got back, I took a few more religion classes, and pretty soon I realized if I just took a couple more classes, I would have a religion major too. Uh, and so when I graduated from the University of Iowa, I had a degree in anthropology and religion. Uh, and as part of the, that, I was a little bit of an overachiever. Uh, and I did, I had, I did the, the paper on the war, was my honors thesis in anthropology. Uh, I did an honors thesis in religion uh, on uh, this group, a breakaway group from the Native American church that combined uh, peyotism, the use of peyote, a hallucinogenic cactus, with the word of wisdom and Mormon beliefs. Mm. Uh, and uh, I, I should say that uh, in, in my anthropology classes, uh, particularly a class on American Indians, uh, and then doing some archaeological work on some uh, native sites, uh, sparked uh, an interest in, uh, in in the stories that my grandmother had always told us as a kid uh, of a, an Indian ancestor. An Indian princess is the term she would use, or a Lamanite ancestor was often the term that was used. And so I, as I took these classes, I was like, well, I want to know more about this ancestor. And so I, when I was back home, I would ask my grandma all sorts of questions about it. And she told me, well, she thought she was Iroquois. Uh, and you know a few details that that she thought that this story had been passed on by uh, her. Uh, I guess it would have been her grandfather. And uh, he talked about being about his grandmother grandmother who was native, uh, and this was back before they moved to Idaho. Uh, in and they lived in Kansas in the late nineteenth century, uh, and. Uh, this uh, 
Indian grandmother would not be allowed in the house, uh, and he would end up playing with her outside in the yard. Uh, and it, it really troubled me to think that this native ancestor of mine would be treated that way uh, by her own children and uh, in-laws. Uh, and so that became a question that was stewing. Uh, and so I, I started exploring more my own, the native side of my ancestry as well as the Mormon side of my ancestry. And that began in college. Uh, and one way that I did that was I started looking at uh, where Native American and Mormon ideas came together. Uh, and I, by chance, ran across an article about these peyotists who'd gotten arrested in Texas and they uh, ran a church in Arizona that combined Mormonism with peyotism. And Around thought, what year? Well, they, the decade? year that they were arrested or the year, I don't remember exactly Just the year they were arrested. Generally, I was when doing, was happening? I was doing this research in about 92. No, when was this nativist church doing its thing? Oh, the they, they, they are still around. Is no, but when peyote? was this getting arrested and in, when was it forming? In the 80s. Okay, okay, yeah. 1980s. Yeah, okay. and, uh, and well, they had, there's a quite a bit longer history of the connection between peyotism and Mormonism, I would discover, you know, Joseph Smith's grandson, who would eventually become the president of the RLDS, uh, RLDS uh, had did a, a dissertation in sociology on peyotism and had uh, used it quite a bit and as part of understanding his prophetic callings. And uh, so it, it, there's this whole fascinating combination between Mormonism and peyotism. And so that became my honors thesis in uh, anthropology, I mean, excuse me, in religion. Uh, and two honors theses weren't enough for me. <laughs> uh, so I did a third one. It wasn't a thes honors thesis per se, uh, but I applied for a research grant, an undergraduate research grant to go to Guatemala. Uh, and uh, the grant was for health-related research. And because I'd gotten involved with this, you know, intriguing uh, interpretations of the Word of Wisdom in Arizona, uh, I, I proposed to look at how is the word of wisdom, uh, how does the word of wisdom change Mayan uh, practices when Mayan people convert to Mormonism? That was my research question. Uh, and so that research was funded and I went to Antigua, Guatemala and this would have been the, uh, the summer of 1993 or 90, 92 maybe. Yeah, 92. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I I brought my daughter along uh, and my wife and my mother-in-law for a part of the time uh, and did language study. Uh, I think I, I went there first and they came later, but I uh, did language study uh, and then got, even though by this time I was a non-believer, I did attend church for research purposes. Uh, and so I was attending this ward that lacked Melchizedek priesthood holders and very quickly they were like grabbing onto me and like, you know, we need you to do this, we need you to help pass the sacrament and all this. And I didn't own a white shirt purposefully. Uh, and so I remember the bishop lending me a white shirt so I could bless mm -hmm. the sacrament. And, uh, and uh, so I was involved pretty heavily in the ward there uh, and, uh, and conducted this research. and. I very purposely in that research did something that is not often done in Mormon studies. Uh, and I made sure that I included inactive people because remember I was inactive <laughs> at home. And I really felt that if you really want to understand Mormonism, you need to go beyond the people that go to church. Uh, and you know, this peyote group in Arizona were not traditional Mormons. I was, so I was always interested in that non-traditional Mormon experience. So. In my interviews, I interviewed nearly as many inactive members as I did active members. Uh, and so I had a pretty great data, data set in that regard. Uh, I ended up flipping the research question uh, at the recommendation of my uh, advisor. Uh, Nora England was her name, she's a great uh, a Mayanist. Uh, and she pointed out as we were going through the data in my first uh, practice presentation of it, uh, the, the more interesting question was uh, not how did Mormonism change 
Mayans, but how did Mayans change Mormonism? Uh, and uh, what the data showed is that the in, in interpretations of the word of wisdom uh, that they did that extended beyond the usual things like uh, coffee and tea uh, followed the traditional Mayan concepts of hot and cold medicine. Uh, and so the extra things like chili peppers and uh, chocolate and uh, those were things that they added to the word of wisdom, if you will, in their interpretations. Those followed a logic, a Mayan logic, uh, rather than a North American uh, Anglo logic. Uh, and so that ended up being the, the, the flipped research question. And I would eventually, uh, in graduate school, publish that research in the uh, Journal for the Scientific Study of Religion. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I actually published all of those. Well, no, I, I guess I didn't. Well, yes, I did. I published all of those uh, theses. The, the one on the war would be published. I won an award from the Elie Wiesel Foundation uh, for the essay I wrote about the war, and that would be published by uh, Elie Wiesel uh, in an anthology of award winners. Uh, and I published the, the peyote, uh, the work on, the, on peyote uh, was published by the Peyote Way Church of God themselves uh, and in in their uh, what they called the sacred record uh, and the the work in Guatemala actually produced a couple of different articles uh, the one for the Journal of Scientific Study of Religion that was on the medicine but I also published another one that was on identity issues and that wasn't an original research question but it became really a fascinating question for me and everywhere I'd go in Guatemala that I introduced myself to Mormons as an anthropologist the question was, have you read the Popol Vuh? And uh, before that time, I never heard of the Popol Vuh. Uh, and uh, I, at the language school I was attending, they had a viewing of, of the, uh, of an animated version of the Popol Vuh by Patricia Amlin. Uh, and so I went and watched that, and I'm like, what does this have to do with Mormonism? It is pretty bizarre. Uh, and, uh, and so I was, I, I added to my research or to my interview questions questions about the Popol Vuh uh, because that was the question everybody was asking me about. Uh, and what I found that was quite astounding is that the, these Mayan and, and Ladino, Ladino are people that uh, they're Mayan in heritage, but they've adopted culturally the, the dominant mainstream Spanish uh, culture and identify perhaps more with that than their Mayan heritage. Uh, but in Mayan and Ladino members of the church, uh, they're applying the Popol Vuh alongside the Book of Mormon uh, and seeing it as, uh, in some cases, equivalent to the Book of Mormon. And that was like, wow, this is kind of interesting. Uh, and the other thing that came up in the in, in uh, priesthood meetings was one uh, particularly outspoken person who'd lived in the United States for a while, you'd, be, you'd call him probably a Ladino because of his culture, that, that's the culture he was uh, more practicing. But he would emphasize that uh, Lamanites, and he self-identified as a Lamanite, uh, were born into the covenant of Abraham were Anglos, and he saw me simply as an Anglo, uh, were adopted into the covenant, and that uh, Lamanites were destined to be the leaders of the church in the last days, uh, and that Anglos uh, would be event that eventually that uh, they would give up the leadership of the church, uh, and that that was prophesied in the Book of Mormon, and they could show me the passages. Uh, and wow, was, they were wow. paying attention when they were reading. Yeah, <laughs> and so that was like, whoa, this is pretty interesting stuff. Uh, and I'd been reading while I was in Guatemala, uh, Lamont Tulis's book Mormons in Mexico, and had. The Tulis or Tulis? I'm not, not sure what, how you pronounce it. Okay. Uh, I, yeah. He, he was my professor. I I thought it was Tulis. So Tulis. I, I'm okay. just making sure it's the same. Yeah. Guy. Yeah. The same guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And at, at BYU. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, it was a great book, and uh, he talked about this schism in Mexico in the 1930s 
uh, called the Third Convention. And I was like, wow, here, here are parallels to this in, in uh, the 1990s in, uh, in Guatemala. And so I wrote an article about that for Dialogue. What was the Third Convention? Uh, the Third Convention was a, a group of uh, Mexican Mormons uh, who about a third of the Mexican Mormons broke away from the LDS Church in the 1930s in response to the church's ref kind of avoidance, if you will, of the at least the spirit of the law, which the anti-clerical uh, legislation that had been passed in Mexico uh, after the revolution uh, had said that uh, that clergy needed to come from with from within Mexico. They couldn't be brought from the outside, uh, and the church had gotten around that rule by bringing uh, Anglos from the colonies Chihuahua and, in Chihuahua and Sonora uh, down as mission president in uh, the Mex Mex Mexico City area. Uh, and the, the Mexican members felt like that was, a, 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 if not a violation of the letter of the law, certainly of the spirit of the law. Uh, and so they had petitioned in their first con and second convention to the uh, first presidency to reconsider the appointment of, of the, the mission president. Uh, and when the, that wouldn't be reconsidered, uh, they withdrew from the church and started their own uh, wards. And, or, wow, Mormon? Yeah, Mormon yeah, parallel, ran their own parallel church. Huh. Uh, and they ran their own parallel church for a decade. Uh, and uh, that would become a research topic of mine later. Did they end up re reintegrating or just dying out? I... Well, I'll tell you how I got to answer that question. Uh, I ended up applying for graduate school, go to the University of Washington. Uh, and uh, while in graduate school at the University of Washington, my purpose was to, or my proposal, my research proposal for graduate school was to investigate uh, Mormon and Native relations. I really wanted to know why my grand, my, why my Native ancestors had had joined the church, but I didn't know how to how to do that research. I couldn't figure out a methodology to do that research. So, like a typical anthropologist, although now I sometimes think it, it was a rather naive approach. But but it's not entirely wrong. It turned out to be informative. But the idea was well, if I studied contemporary Native American Mormons, I could better understand why somebody would convert to a church that taught that a, a dark skin was a curse from God. Uh, and so I thought, well, if I look at contemporary Native American Mormons, I'd have better understand my own ancestors. And that, I think, as a research, because there's some problems with it from an intellectual level, but that was a very common way for anthropologists to approach these questions. I, and so uh, I started focusing on contemporary Native American Mormons. Uh, and so uh, while, while I was at the University of Washington, I was offered a research assistant position uh, in southern Mexico in a, a, the state of Oaxaca. And it was for a Zapotec ethnobiology research project. Uh, and while I was there, I was curious about what had happened with the Third Convention. Because what uh, Tolis, is that right? Yeah. Tolis had said in his book was that uh, after about 10 years, the uh, in a negotiate, a, a, a kind of a a new mission president that was a little more uh, tolerant uh, and with mediation by the, the president of the church uh, brought most of the schismatic group, the third, the third convention, back into the fold. But that uh, there were a couple of groups that, that, or some that had stayed out. And according to Tullis, or Tullis, sorry, uh, what they had kind of fizzled out but a big character in this was a man by the name, name of Margarito Bautista. And so uh, what I did when I had a break on my research project in Oaxaca is I jumped on a train and I uh, went to Osumba, Mexico. Uh, and I got a hotel for stay for a few days. And I started looking for relatives of Margarito Bautista. And uh, so... I first asked the hotel owner and uh, if he'd heard of Margarito Bautista, if he knew of it, and he's like, no, no, there are Bautistas, a lot of Bautistas. 
Uh, and I said, well, he was Mormon. He said, oh, yeah, we got some of those. Uh, we got some Mormons over here. Uh, and he said, they're over in this uh, colonia nearby. He actually gave me the wrong name of the, the colony, but uh, it got me close. Uh, and so I just walked down the, the street. It was a couple mile walk and, uh, and ended up in this colonia. And I found the first store and started asking them if they'd heard of Margarito Bautista. And, uh, and again, it's like, no, uh, there are some Bautistas, kind of that sort of thing. And I said, well, how about Mormons? And they said, oh, yeah, the Mormons, they live over there. <laughs> uh, and so I followed their directions and I walked into this. Really, it was, it was like, uh, I, I guess the thing that struck me the most is how clean the community was. There were kids sweeping the streets. Uh, it was very immaculate. And it was also economically, there was a definitely a, a, an economic, there were more cars, there were nicer houses. There was an economic difference between this community and the community surrounding it. And those kind of things struck me right away. It's like, oh, wow, this is, this is different. Uh, and so I saw the kids sweeping the street. So I uh, asked them if, if they knew of any relatives of Macarito Bautista. And, uh, and they said, wait a minute. Uh, and they went and uh, got a woman. Uh, and she came over and I asked her the same question. And, and she says, uh, hang on, uh, the bishop's not in town, uh, but uh, let me go see if his counselor can talk to you. And so uh, she took me to the, the home of the, of the first counselor in the bishopric. Uh, and uh, I introduced myself to him. And initially, I think there was a, it was a little bit of suspicion, but I had, I had a copy of Margarito Bautista's book with me. Uh, and I knew a little bit about their history. And I knew uh, enough that it, it, they saw me as a credible uh, researcher, uh, and I, you know, from what I understand, I'm the only outside researcher that ever got let into this community. This is reminding me of Colorado City and the yeah. MLDS Church for some reason. Yeah. Just well, they're not associated with. No, them, no, no. But, I'm just saying but it, the, the but culture. they are associated with the All Red Group. So uh, they were polygamists. Yeah, they were polygamists. Yeah. And the United Order. Yeah, and United okay, Order. I read that in your article. I yeah. Didn't know. Okay. Yeah, they were polygamous in United Order. So plural marriage, as they called it, you know. But were they? Yeah. Ethnically Mexican. Entirely. Okay. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And so, this. Have you talked to Lindsay at the park about this yet? Uh, this no, I haven't talked to her about okay. this story. Okay. You got to get on your polygamy yeah. and tell her the story. Yeah. And we, uh, well, I. It's, uh, established my credibility by knowing a little bit about their history and having Margarito's book there. And so they agreed to some interviews. And uh, I interviewed uh, the first counselor, and I think I think the other one was the bishop. Or, Did you know, record it? Audio? Yeah, yeah they recorded. You still yeah. got it? Uh, yes. Yes, I do, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, they're like on those old cassette tapes. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and it, they were some of my first ethnographic interviews, and I had this thing on my tape recorder where I would, it would have a time saver, it saved tape, because I would worry, was worried I wouldn't have enough tape. So it cut off the first and last words of every question. It was uh. a really great learning experience as an <laughs> ethnographer. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, I did get uh, the interviews, uh, and I kept notes as well. Uh, so the, the, it wouldn't make a good transcript or a yeah. good audio no, no, to I share. Just, but uh, but the, it, it was fascinating to hear their story, and uh, I would later come back uh, in the summer. Of that, so that was in ni 1996. And how was Tolis wrong? Uh, well, he was wrong in that he thought the group had fizzled out. And here were, uh, they said they had about 700 members uh, in this community, and they had more in, uh, in other parts of Mexico, and in, uh, they had quite a few in, in uh, Arizona huh. and uh, some in Utah. And they had some members that were like in uh, graduate school. I wonder how they got affiliated with the All Red Group. Uh, it, through, it was partly through the LeBarons, and which is a whole other uh, wow. story as well. Uh, and uh, the Margarito Bautista had uh, been, uh, he'd been in the colonies, and he'd been, he'd lived in Utah, 
Uh, and so he'd, he'd had those social connections. Uh, and so anyway, they, here's this thriving Mexican version of Mormonism uh, that uh, very few people knew about uh, and uh, outside of their own group. Uh, and so uh, I did get a few interviews. Uh, I would later return a couple of times and do some, uh, some more interviews. Uh, and unfortunately, in that case, my, my video camera uh, that I did a lot of video recording with got stolen uh, on my return trip from the airport. So I lost a lot of the footage, but uh, I, did, I was able to incorporate that research, and that would become part of my doctoral dissertation. Which was uh, on? With my doctoral dissertation is called Imagining Lamanites, Native Americans, in the Book of Mormon. Uh, and it really, the, the goal of it was to say kind of two questions. One question is, how have Mormons imagined Lamanites? Uh, where, where does this ethnonym, Lamanite, come from? Uh, how is it related to cultural ideas at the time of Joseph Smith? Uh, and then how does it get expressed in Mormonism, first by uh, white Mormons, uh, but then most importantly, by Native Mormons, uh, and na not just Native Mormons, but what did Native Americans have to say about this? Uh, and again, I, my personal goal is I wanted to understand why my ancestors would have joined a church that seemed to me to be rather explicitly racist. I wanted to understand in their terms, uh, the term in the terms of contemporary Native Mormons, uh, what what appealed to them uh, about the church or what didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where it really, well, the, part of it became, a significant portion became about Margarito Bautista uh, and uh, about another, and so he was Nahua, uh, and about another Nahua uh, scholar who would eventually uh, become a a stake president uh, and a temple president and uh, I think a mission president as well. Uh, and some of their differing views about uh, how how to tell the story of being Mexican and being Mormon. Uh, and I wrote an article that's in the Journal of Mormon History. It's called Other Mormon Histories. And that's by far my favorite article of what I've, that's in press right now. I have some ones coming out that I think I'm more excited about. but. Uh, that article really looked at the question of how in new Mormon history can we do justice to the stories of Nahua Mormons? And there's some fundamental problems with the way we tell history. Uh, and uh, even our best historiography today slights and misrepresents and does damage to their stories. And so how do I, as a academic scholar, tell their stories in a way that's both accurate and represents their story? Uh, and, and so the article is about the dilemma. Of, it, there's no resolution that I offer. It's just the dilemma. How do we do this? And so I title it Other Mormon Histories. These are ones that don't fit in our regular narratives, and that whether it's the narratives of the church or the narratives of uh, academia. Uh, and that was a chapter in my dissertation and would be a, a, a journal article and kind of the, a, a big centerpiece of it. So we're at about an hour for this okay. first segment. I want to talk about, uh, I want to get to the discussion about DNA and your disciplinary council as a springboard into the more important stuff that I know you really feel passionately about. But to close out this segment, is there anything else you would need to tell us just in terms of the narrative to get us to the point where next segment we start talking about that? Uh, just briefly. Yeah, I think the, the timing is about right to, to make that move. Uh, yeah, so... So by the time you're graduating with your PhD, you had been focusing on understanding 
trying to understand why a Native American in the 19th century would join the church, mm -hmm. and you were doing that by by studying uh, Native American Mormons in the 20th century, mm -hmm. and that took you to Mexico and Guatemala and understanding not only the ways that the church, not only the things that the church had done there and the way that the church was experienced there, but the way that the natives had influenced the church back. Mm -hmm. And then that led also to trying to understand better uh, how the church thought of Native Americans, how Native American Mormons, how Native American, American Mormons thought about themselves. And, and matters of identity as it related sort of bi-directionally. Is that? that that's a very good summary. Uh, and yeah, and that was the, that was the primary interest of, of what I was doing uh, up until, actually through the first draft of my dissertation. Uh, and the, the first draft of my dissertation had a big section on uh, the Popol Vuh and the use of the Popol Vuh uh, by Mormons and also an ethnographic or ethno-historical component in the United States of the uses of uh, Black Elk Speaks uh, by Native Mormons. And yeah. particularly the idea of using the Popol Vuh and Black Elk Speaks as other Bibles, other scriptures. Yeah. Uh, actually, my committee asked me to pull out the work on the Popol Vuh and Black Elk Speaks and elaborate instead on the work I was doing with Nahua Mormons and the ethno-historical look uh, at the church in general uh, if, of its treatment of Native Americans. Because uh, I cover the, from the, before the founding of the church through the present, uh, and they wanted that to be more the focus. And that's a good point to okay. pause. So in the, next, in the next segment, what we're going to go to, just to give uh, our listeners a summary, we're going to go to uh, your work in Mormon, uh, in Native American DNA, the article you published, mm -hmm. the how that led to your disciplinary council, what happened there, um, and then your disappointment in the emphasis on truth claims at the expense of a, a broader discussion about colonialization, mm -hmm. and that can be a platform into talking about the decolonization of Mormonism, of Mormon studies, and of maybe the Mormon internet. Mm -hmm as well. Yeah. How's that sound? That sounds good. All right. Uh, uh, listeners, please join us on Mormon Stories if you have comments or questions. And stay tuned for part two of my interview with uh, Dr. Thomas Murphy. Thanks, Dr. Murphy. You're welcome. We'll see you in a second.